What's up, B2 Capital G here talking about two very degenerate cards that are making things very, very unfun in the competitive scene in Yu-Gi-Oh! right now. These are two cards that I actually think have the potential to ruin an entire format. Hell, maybe the entire year for competitive Yu-Gi-Oh! And, um, you know, not so much for casual play because winning isn't always the end game or the be-all, end-all when it comes to just like, you know, locals and more casual play. It's kind of about having fun, experimenting with your deck, etc., etc. But these are two cards that I think are really, really unhealthy for the game. And if you watch this channel a lot, you know, I don't really throw around that term unhealthy all that much because I feel like it's a very subjective term. You know, a lot of people might have differing opinions, even something like broken, you know, it's kind of subjective as well. Some people might think, you know, can we tolerate the card? How strong is it really? Is it strong in a vacuum? Does it take other cards to really be broken, etc., etc. So I don't generally use the term unhealthy all that much, but these are two cards that I don't really think I'll get much pushback on because I don't think that they're very much fun to deal with. And the big thing about this, and I don't want people thinking, oh, Cap G, what are you doing? The format just started. You're already dumping and you're already, you know, going to try and ban like 50 cards in the new meta. That's not really what this is about. This is about two cards that specifically enable FTKs and and FTKs, I kind of understand it. There's always a little bit of kind of like a dirty allure about them. You know, they're kind of cool to watch. It's like, whoa, if you've ever actually seen something like Frog FTK, the first couple of times you watch it, it's like, whoa, that's really, really awesome. But then when you think about it from a competitive standpoint, FTKs are just like, oh my God, like the worst thing ever. Because I like to think of it from a standpoint of you're like at a YCS and, you know, you're playing extremely hard. You're playing very well and you're just trying to top the event and then you end up running into an FTK and there's absolutely no player interaction. I'm not talking about a break my board type of game where at least you have some opportunity to deal with that. I'm talking about you're playing against a deck and you don't even have the opportunity to play cards. They go first, they do what their deck wants to do, they kill you, game two becomes irrelevant because if they go you know, third and they open up with said combo, you're basically out of the game. Now let me go ahead and talk about the two cards or at least you know, bring the two cards cards up for anybody who doesn't know where I'm going with this video. The, co the two cards that I'm specifically talking about our number one, Gem Knight Lapis Azuli, and then number two, uh, Liralouche Independent Nightingale. And the interesting thing is, I kind of feel like Konami might just ignore these cards, but I feel like they probably shouldn't, because it would be one thing. Like, I made a video where I talked about three cards that I believed had to be banned on our next ban list, and one of the cards that I brought up was uh, Gem Knight Lapis Azuli, and a lot of people said, you know, oh, come on, Cap G, Gem Knights aren't doing anything. It's a table 500 deck. It's not going to be that good. Why isn't it dominating in the OCG, etc., etc.? And I said, okay, that, that that's fine. I, you know, if you want to use the benefit of the doubt, I can't really argue against that. We don't have any competitive numbers on, you know, the deck, but now we're actually starting to get that in. I don't know if you guys have kept up with the regional scene, but I've watched a couple of videos from uh, House of Champs from John's channel, and two Gem Knights have already topped in this new format. Now, the format, or Really, since Extreme Force came out, it hasn't been all that long, but we've already seen two Gem Knight players play the FTK deck and actually make it in the top eight, and that is pretty, like, that's kind of disturbing to me because, again, you're talking about a deck that doesn't give you a second turn if it goes first and it opens up with his combo. And one of my biggest problems with Lapis Azuli has always been, and I've talked about this in the past, she really doesn't fit well in her own archetype. Like, if you actually look at her effect and you put it in the context of how Gem Knights actually want to play and how they were kind of designed to be able to do what they want to do, she just doesn't fit in. Even though Gem Knights are technically from the 5Ds era because they're dual terminal one, they really feel like they play very similar to some of the Arc V archetypes like uh, Fluffles and Luna Light, some of the other fusion decks of the past era, in the sense that they've got some colossal sized monsters, they want to summon a bunch of them on the field, and then basically be able to push for like an OTK. Master Rule 4 didn't help with that, that's why they obviously got a Link monster, but that is the obvious playstyle of Gem Knights. In fact, that's why they have so many big ass monsters like Lady Brilliant Diamond, 3400, Master Diamond, 3000, you know, um, Gem Knight Zirconia, 20. That's why they have this beastly tank lineup of monsters that can do a whole lot of 
auto damage really, really quickly. And then you get this one Lapis Azuli card that is kind of small and does like this really powerful burn effect. And it's like, wait, what? One of these things does not belong with the other. You could almost say that about Gem Knight Seraphronites, but at least hypothetically with Seraphronite, you can get more normal summons to try and get more fusion summons. So I kind of get how that can work a little bit. But Lapis Azuli goes down a completely different route in her effect. All the other Gem Knights are about getting a bunch of damage on board or like getting cards off your opponent's board. And then she has this really weird kind of random burn effect. And even though Konami tried to put a little bit of a balancer on her, the fact that you can only special summon one of her in a turn, it, it's completely mitigated by the fact that they also gave the Master Diamond a card that can just copy like Gem Knight monsters from the graveyard. So even though you only summon one Lapis Azuli in a turn, doesn't really matter if Master Diamond can just copy her effect and then you can do tons of burn damage and you can just kill your opponents. And I don't know, I feel like having an FTK deck in the format, especially when it's already topping regionals, is a very, very bad thing. And then to kind of double down on that point, we need to talk about our second elephant in the room. That is Lirelouch Independent Nightingale. I'm going to say off the top that she came out in Maximum Crisis. I think that's about the time that Ruri uh, got her cards because she dueled really late in the show. But Independent Nightingale is a card that you never really see properly summoned in someone actually playing like Lirelouch. It's a card that is, it feels like it's way too overtuned for a card that no one actually summons properly. And it's a card that is already caused collateral damage. I kind of feel like it's a card that should have never actually been created. I have no idea why Konami felt the need to make it unaffected by all other effects. That is a ludicrous that they put that effect into her and I kind of understand it because it's kind of a situation where it's not really independent Nightingale's fault because it's like, well, she's not broken, but the other things that can use her power are essentially causing the problem. So I guess she is technically the root of evil but independent nightingale is a card that has already caused other cards to get banned you guys remember when the tyrant neptune got banned it got banned in the tcg and in the ocg and we know why specifically it was because of the independent nightingale combo where you'd get a tyrant neptune you'd burn your opponent for like six thousand damage and if they didn't kill it uh immediately you would just burn them again during your next turn and basically outside of like honest and kaijus there was almost no way your opponent could kill it i want to say the tyrant neptune would have something like uh 6,000 attacks so you weren't you weren't gonna take it down in battle but we saw that card get completely banned in both regions of Yu-Gi-Oh for this card's existence and after that people thought okay well I, I guess uh, you know the problem is over but it's not really over in fact over the weekend at YCS Atlanta we saw a pendulum FTK deck make it all the way to top 16 do you do people understand that this deck was literally like uh, a few wins away from being in the finals and now that the blueprint is out there, it's just going to get more and more popular. People are going to be picking it up. People are going to be interested because if you've already got the Electromites, you can build the deck for basically the same exact price. I, I thought that Master Rule 4, because I knew about this play with the, uh, you know, the Supreme King Servant Venom Dragon that can basically uh, copy the effect from the graveyard of Independent Nightingale after you instant fusion her out. I believe you turn it into a Link Karibo just to get into the grave quickly. You link a couple more times and then boom, you just pop out your Starving Venom Dragons. I thought that the combo was not going to be viable because when this card came out, which I believe was Code of the Duelist, we were going to have a format with Master Master Rule 4. So I was like, okay, well, Master Rule 4 is obviously going to kill this, you know, FTK, but no, it, it apparently hasn't. The FTK is still alive, and as Link Monsters get more and more generic, it's not like this combo is going to get worse anytime soon. And the thing is, I feel like Konami already set a bad precedent, which, by the way, they do all the time, especially with, like, Dragon Rulers. You guys remember how many cards got banned because of that archetype. Dragon Ravine was banned for forever. I mean, fucking Super Rejuvenation is still banned because of the Dragon Rulers. But, you know, if you look at the Tyrant Neptune, was that card ever broken? Was that card ever ban-worthy before Independent Nightingale came out? No, it wasn't. And now they banned it because of that. So, like, what do you do as Konami? I mean, do you go ahead? 
ahead and do you ban Supreme King uh, Dragon Starving Venom? But then where does the line stop? Because I feel like it's only a matter of time before two, three years down the road, you release another card that can copy from the graveyard and then the problem comes back up. Why not just go ahead and nip it in the butt? I think that uh, Independent Nightingale is very similar to like Gen Releaser of Rituals where, yeah, Konami could have nerfed Necroz into the ground, but if they ever want to make another strong ritual deck again, all right, well, if you ever get another tier one ritual deck, people might start looking at Gen again. Then you basically have the Gen lock all over again. So why not just get rid of Gen? I feel like Independent Nightingale is kind of just going to be a problem forever until they get the card out of the game. And even if they end up hitting other cards, it's only a matter of time before just another card comes up. Unless they're just going to ban Instant Fusion and they're going to kind of continue this whole thing of hitting cards around it, not hitting the direct problem. Maybe if they do that, but the fact that you can Instant Fusion this card and now you can turn it into a Link Monster, which you couldn't, we didn't know about that before. Yeah, that definitely makes a problem, but uh, I don't know, man. I feel like these are two cards. They're both FTK enablers. These FTKs are actually topping competitive events now, so don't be shocked if they show up at YCS. I believe it is. Is it San Jose? It's one of the ones in California, and then we have one in Utah. Like, don't be shocked if these end up making top eights, and then maybe Konami won't be able to ignore it anymore. So, you guys let me know what you think. I'm really hoping that on our next ban list, which I think will probably be before Nationals, maybe it'll be in about May or June or something. I'm hoping that they address these two cards, because no one likes actually dealing with, like, no one likes dueling against FTK decks, seriously. Whatever you guys think, leave it in the comment section below. Thank you guys for watching. As always, subscribe if you have not already. Turn on that notification bell for daily videos.